So hello everyone. It is three o'clock um, here in Central Europe and a different time of day wherever you are. Um, some of the people joining us from the UK, some people from North America and who knows where else. So that's really great. Um, thanks for joining us today. We'll just give like one minute before people, um, everyone's kind of still coming in right now. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, wow, a lot of headlines in digital marketing lately, right? TikTok um, canceling or pulling out of their live commerce, their live shopping offering. Microsoft coming out of nowhere, acquiring Netflix as their advertising uh, technology and sales partner. Google saying that maybe they're going to split up their structure internally before U.S. Congress tries to break them up. So some really interesting things going on right now. Uh, and we could almost talk about all that stuff, but we're here for a different topic today. That's enhanced performance max as we're calling it, or it's kind of our approach to the way that performance max campaigns are best managed or it's, it's one approach. I think there are a ton out there seeing some really interesting articles and white papers and so on coming out from different folks. Great um, conversations happening in the community on Twitter, on LinkedIn everybody's attention is on performance max right now and um in a bit i think we'll explain why that is but we're by the way talking about pmax retail campaign so pmax for e-commerce um i'll just introduce myself real short work real quickly my name is mike and uh oops that's actually not my job title anymore head of retail insights i just spotted that now um portfolio strategist and all this means is that um at this company smarter e-commerce mac i help guide our strategy and offering in terms of digital marketing um, and e-commerce technology and services. So I've got a background in retail operations. I've been in um, e-commerce now for five years, but I've been in um, retail operations for my whole career before that. And I've done all kinds of stuff, uh, purchasing and um, <clears throat> logistics and supply chain, ton of fun things. And um, since I got in e-commerce, I've been building up my background in product and innovation software. Uh, I'm also really into storytelling with data. If any of you follow me on, on like LinkedIn, for example, you might um, know that from some of my posts. And I've been very happily here in sunny, beautiful Austria for about five years now. Um, <clears throat> and just a quick word about this company, Smarter E-commerce. So I've been in e-commerce for just five years. SMEC has been in e-commerce for 15 years, three times as long. And we've got uh, approaching 500 clients from all over the world, mostly in Europe. And um, supporting those clients, we've got 170 e-commerce and software specialists. So we've got a lot of brain power in our, in our organization. And I'm the one lucky enough to kind of um, come on here in a webinar like this and, and talk to you all. But there's so many great people behind the scenes here. Shout out to all those people. Um, and our focus is like 90% on retailers, but still 10% of 480, we're at about 50 brands that, that we work with as well. Um, so on today's agenda, let's talk about what is Performance Max really? So we won't, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about like the, the structure of Performance Max, but it's not really an intro to Performance Max. That's not what we want to spend our time on today too much. There's some great resources out there. If you're really new to Performance Max and you want to know what are these bits and pieces, there's a lot of great stuff out there. Um, and like also, by the way, the PPC chat community on Twitter, they've got um, a couple, you can go to officialppchat.com and check out they, they consolidate their threads, they roll their threads together into these nice information bundles, um, for example. And we're gonna talk about um, the adoption and implications of the adoption, which is getting to that point about why is this theme so hot right now? Why is it so significant? Um, and then we'll talk about our approach here, which is we call, we nickname it Enhanced PMAX, um, and why this theme, why we've developed this approach how it's related to that adoption level um, and tie that together. So what is Performance Max really? Um, I always say this, this is kind of, you know, my thesis statement about Performance Max. I think that Performance Max is the new Google Ads platform and it's kind of incubating inside of the old Google Ads. Um, but if you look at a kind of more formal definition from 
Google. This is my favorite one. It comes from the API. It's very straightforward. It's a unified buying service to all Google Ads inventory. So think about how impressive that is. It's not just shopping. It's not just search. Um, it's not just any of these single components. It is this vast um, collection of advertising inventory that's all getting served from one point, served and purchased and all this from, from one single point, which is very impressive when you think about the technology that that takes, that requires. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at it, a structural difference, like the classic campaigns like search and shopping, for example, uh, you'd have a campaign and you'd have an ad group and um, the very beloved method of forming text ad campaigns back in the days um, and still some of these campaigns out there now today um, is the single keyword ad group format. So you'd kind of attach keywords to your ad groups and you'd have this very granular, very tightly controlled campaign. This is losing effectiveness due to what's happening with matching and so on um, and automation on that side. And on the shopping side, you would tend to have um, also typically quite granular uh, product groups and this would be a way of kind of de-averaging performance or something like that. Because let's say you're using a smart bidding technology like Target ROAS, and this is kind of pursuing an average performance in a way, you might want to try to um, correct for that averaging effect by being really granular in your setup. Now, if we look at performance max, um, the ad group has been replaced with something called an asset group. And this is just um, a little bit different in nature. It's in some ways very analogous, but it basically includes, as the name suggests, more assets. And these are like the Lego bricks that go together to form dynamic creatives. Um, and so that's what you populate in there. So where an ad group could have kind of any logic that you wanted, an asset group, because of this uh, asset-based nature of it, needs to be thematically linked somehow. We'll talk about that more later. Then you've got underneath that listing groups, which are optional, and that's effectively a product group um, where you link your products from the Merchant Center. And then what's really cool compared to, for example, smart shopping, where audiences basically fell away, um, you can add in audience signals, different kinds. And... Um, those are audience signals act as a starting point for Google. They're not going to kind of bound or constrict what, what Google does there, but they, they kind of um, are encouraged to speed up the learning. And it's kind of like when you start listening to a song on Spotify and then the algorithm says, mm, you might like this one next. Um, so why is Performance Max so special? Well, it's this strange creature that's kind of got bits from smart shopping. It's got things like part, pieces from responsive display, dynamic search. It's sort of the ultimate automation. And I think the most interesting addition to Performance Max relative, Performance Max retail relative to smart shopping campaigns of the past would be the inclusion of search. That's also quite controversial because um, many people feel that this is really chewing up a lot, like kind of just serving brand traffic, cannibalizing brand traffic. It's tough to control. So that's been a topic. Um, but it's very clear that this is going to be the launching pad for everything that comes from Google Shopping, uh, from, excuse me, from Google Ads now. Um, every new cool thing that Google does is going to be in um, Performance Max and those standard campaigns, legacy campaigns, they have their use cases too. Uh, but they're going to probably not be updated with the same kind of pace and interest from Google side as performance maximal. Um, and I also think there's going to be a lot of stuff coming from um, the merchant center as well. A lot of developments going on there, insights coming there. Let's see. And this will be important for Pmax too, because Google has, um, there's criticism here too, but you know, let's let's give them some credit they are offering new kinds of insights they're rolling stuff out they're adding back different like you know some new location targeting controls came back um i think they got the message that people were dissatisfied with the the lack of control and promotional control lack of insight in smart shopping and we'll probably never get everything that we want but we'll get some of it um by the way i just saw the first question roll in through the q a so after this talk um there there'll be a q a but like we did this webinar in Germany yesterday and there were way more questions than we could answer. Um, I encourage you, please send your questions in. That's really great. Um, and just what I'm gonna do is gonna pour myself a really tall coffee tomorrow. And I'm gonna try and answer all the questions and publish an article with everything in there um, as soon as I can. 
no promises when exactly, but um, so, you know, the sort of trade-offs or the, yeah, the, the possible downsides of this extremely impressive and advanced level of automation is that it is a closed system compared to standard campaign types. Uh, most notably, you don't get really a lot of insight into, into placements and um, that's concerning for some people. I, I can understand that. And it's kind of take it or leave it. Either you want that extra reach and you don't know exactly what it's comprised of or, or you leave it behind. Um, and it calls for a modernized approach for campaign management. So that's a, that's kind of a shift in mindset for a lot of people, being a lot more um, selective and and let, you know I, I think it's that we were kind of micromanaging campaigns in the past, and it wasn't for no reason. It made a lot of sense, um, but now we we need to be a little hands off and we need to operate on a different level, and that's what we're going to talk about later on. Um, namely, that requires really strong strategies and great data. And I'll explain to you why soon. Um, <clears throat> strategic inputs, here we go. Guiding Google wisely. Um, first, I wanna talk about that adoption that we're expecting with Performance Max that we're already seeing. Um, this chart here, if you look at the purple line, that's the growth rate of Performance Max in terms of share of spend. And just to be clear there, there's more spend in Google Ads and it would be reflected here. There are still these standard campaigns. There's, you know, the mid tail campaigns, YouTube campaigns, all this kind of stuff. But if we're talking about, let's say we're looking at 100% of the budget that is assigned to either um, standard shopping, smart shopping, or performance max from, from that sum, this is what we're talking about here. And those are the, those are the gray bars. You'll see um, on the Y axis, excuse me, the left-hand Y axis, the share of spend, where that's um, where that's going to reach, and we estimate that it's going to reach eighty percent by the end of the year. So I want to add a little context there, because this is so important for why people are taking Pmax so seriously and why they should. Um, eighty percent of previously kind of shopping spend or product listing spend now shifting over to Performance Max. What does that mean? I think it's interesting because in Google's earning reports or Alphabet's earning reports, they don't, at least correct me if I'm wrong, but they don't really specify what is the revenue of Google shopping. Um, it's not, I don't think it's broken down at that level, but I saw a really interesting post on LinkedIn the other day from uh, a VP of engineering. He's been at Google for 17 years and he was saying goodbye to the company. Really sweet post. One thing that was so interesting, he was talking about his accomplishments and he mentioned that um, he and the engineers at Google built Google Shopping from nothing to a $20 billion channel. So there's that number. Now reflect back on 80%, 80% of $20 billion shifting over to a brand new technology that um, is basically, you know, in the course of a year, every month, month by month. Uh, in fact, you know, you could argue, okay, the beta from beta to to this level of adoption is like a year. From really the general availability to this level of adoption, it's more like nine months. So this is not just um, a, a shifting of the tide or a sea change. It's more like a rip tide or a storm surge in the digital advertising ecosystem. Because remember how big Google is um, in the whole in the whole picture here. So it's it's really significant, and I love this quote from Niels Grube. He's the product lead for smart bidding and automation, at least here in Europe. I guess they've got regional product leads. Um, and he wrote a really interesting article on Think with Google. And so the source is in there. You can visit that later on when we share these materials with you. But he says, when everyone's doing the same thing, it's difficult to stand out. And the metaphor that I always make, if you see these race cars on the side of the screen, you know, it's not just that we have got like these self-driving cars. Um, imagine that the, that everything's self-driving cars and it eliminates traffic. It eliminates most accidents and stuff like this. That sounds very appealing. But now imagine that you've got a Formula One race or if you're in North America, a NASCAR race um, and, you know, self-driving cars in a competitive race. Because this isn't just, oh, I want to get to my destination. This is, I am competing with everyone to get to my destination. And so that's a really challenging situation. One, you've got a high level of automation where the manual intervention possibilities are less, where the promotional controls are less, where the insights that you can use to uh, derive and support strategies are less. Um, and I don't wanna knock PMAX too much here. 
it is what it is. This is the way that the product is structured. And we're not here to complain about that. We're here to say, if we're going to use it, how can we use it best? Um, <clears throat> and if you've, I don't know, checked out some of my, my webinars or my talks at conferences before, you know that uh, I'm really big on this topic about input and output, optimizing input and optimizing output. Um, now let's say that performance max in the middle is a black box and I, and I don't want to, black box has such negative connotations, but again, let's take it for what it is um, because this is machine learning, for example, this is our artificial intelligence. And there are also engineering reasons why you can't always know what's going on inside of a system like this. Um, that's not, that's a general problem in AI. It's not a problem just with Google. There are also product, strategic product decisions that they've made, which makes it a black box. But um, in a nutshell, uh, you need to, if you want to outcompete, and if you want to use these campaigns in a way that is best supporting your business, and not just kind of like this, a campaign with, you know, these, let's say, kind of self-referential metrics in there, but that you're really connecting not just, oh, this campaign metrics looks good, but this campaign metric is moving the needle for other parts of our business. Um, then you need to bring great data in and input and output. I think it's very important here too. You think, oh, well, it's the output of a black box. What can I do? Well, it depends. What are you measuring? And are you measuring smartly? Um, we're going to mostly focus today on the input. And I've got another slide about that coming up in a second, but um, how to guide bids um, toward your business or your business objectives. Uh, we know that Google, they've got mountains of data science resources, resources behind them. They've got some of the best AI on the planet. Um, and they have this wealth of audience data. They have this product graph, a knowledge graph of products that they call the shopping graph, which understands products and their and the relationship of different attributes and reviews and all kinds of things. So they've got this wealth of data. That's clear. But that data is not just available to you. It's available to every single person who uses this technology. And then the question is, what can you bring that Google doesn't know? What can you do to help the algorithm and to perform in a way that is more aligned to your business objectives or helps differentiate you from your competitors. And so the argument is clear, you need to bring in off feed, kind of classically off feed data. So not, you know, in your feed, there's a lot of great stuff and there's there's more and more, but what are the things that are not captured in there? What are the things that the channel doesn't know about that Google can't know about? And, you know, there are some supportive uh, idea, uh, examples of that, like your gross margin, your sell through rates, your stock levels in a more granular way, like what's my availability in this size or in this color, these kind of information. Um, even your price attractiveness, you know, it's said that Google considers the price at the auction. Um, is it worth then optimizing on price? I'd say yes, because Google's taking a really narrow view on that. They're looking at, you know, the prediction of a of a click-through rate more or less, or a conversion rate or something like this related to price, how attractive your price is in that auction, but they're not looking at the sum of auctions and what is your pricing strategy. So um, I think that these things are still really important. So that brings us to enhanced performance max. And I wouldn't claim to say that this is a best practice. I don't think that's the case. I think that there are best practices. And I think that it's also still really early to say that this is a best practice or not for us too, you know, we're still rolling this out with clients and um, we're still learning here. This is very new for everyone. But if we get back to those ways that you can differentiate or that you can bring business objectives, business intelligence into your campaign and, you know, activate that data. Um, some of those different ways are the conversion value, for example, instead of optimizing toward ROAS, excuse me, uh, revenue and ROAS, what about optimizing toward growth pro gross profit or toward, um, customer lifetime value. You might also bring in CLV or RFM lists into your audiences. Um, what can you do with your assets and creatives that will stand out? Your pricing. Pricing, some would say, is the new bidding. Um, <clears throat> but we're mostly going to talk about campaign structure right now. And <clears throat> yeah, how do most online retailers set up their campaigns? Well, there's kind of a non-practice out there. And I think we're seeing this a bit, but you know what we're seeing a lot still, I don't know about you, but uh, people are still often testing 
categories, testing brands, easing into things, which I think is is fine, fair enough. Um, but what I would not recommend, maybe there's a use case for it, but having you know this big catch-all campaign, one campaign and one asset group and so on. I don't know if that's how many people would really even do that, or if or if someone wants to argue with me and say there's a use case there, but I think it would just be so generic. Maybe it depends on if you've got a single, if you're a you know single product direct to consumer brand, that could make sense. Um, but anyway, a more common approach would be to create campaigns based on, for example, product types, um, and maybe have a single asset group. And that's for simplicity's sake, because you've got the theme covered, um, somehow thematically covered with that product type or that brand, um, or maybe a seasonal collection, something like this. Uh, and then by having simplicity on the asset group side, you're not getting too much management overhead. Um, but the problem there, again, is this averaging effect. And even within a single brand or a single category, you're going to see just, this is just one dimension alone, product lifecycle. And there are many dimensions for products. But you're going to see that they'll, you know, you've got some products that are brand new into the assortment and they're in their product launch phase. And you might want to treat those ones differently. You've got some where competition is really peaking. Some where the demand is falling off, you've still, you don't want to end up in an overstock situation. Others, you don't want to stock out. You know, you want to pace your inventory with Google Shopping and Performance Max now. Um, and eventually you need to clear things out. So that's just one example, I think, you know, about why you might need other kinds of, of signals in there, like a product lifecycle, for example. So we recommend step one in this enhanced PMAX approach is to segment your campaigns with the right data. Um, you can segment by inventory parameters, product lifecycle being one, for example. Um, <clears throat> you might step it up with some price and competition insights. Um, and we're going to look at a use case a little bit later on for what that can look like. Um, or segment by basket insights. This is a beloved theme of mine. So if you don't know what basket insights are, um, what I'm referring to here is this clicked versus bought dilemma where the product that gets clicked on isn't necessarily the product that gets bought. Um, the, the order in the end, the basket, the order is going to look different in composition in many cases than, than the click that generated that order. Um, so can you reflect these kind of behaviors and phenomenon in your campaigns? Um, and what I recommend is to set your data in place and get a baseline. So um, <clears throat> for example, sorry, I have a little typo on this slide. I realized the, uh, the axes are labeled wrong. Uh, one axis should be the margin low to high and the other should be the stock level. Um, <clears throat> But uh, you see that, um, that in this case, revenue is concentrated in certain clusters of products. I'm going to show you another example as well later on. Um, so you can kind of map this out and see where is the distribution? Okay, this is the distribution of the count of products. This is the distribution of the revenue or cost. Um, but what about other dimensions like the return on ad spend or the value per click, um, conversion rate, average order value? Just see how your products are kind of naturally behaving as they get served by Performance Max. And, it, and then once you've got baseline, then you've got something you can measure against. We'll show you an example of that. So for example, with this, um, with this retailer, they're by the way in the automotive industry, uh, they sell like spare parts for cars and stuff like that. Um, and what they wanted to do was look at competition density and um, look at price attractiveness. So, you know, you can make this kind of simple four box model or um, four, four box analysis here, quadrant analysis, and think about the competitions. A lot of, excuse me, think about the combinations. A lot of com uh, competition with a bad price, that's not too good. Um, not much competition and a really attractive price. Well, this is a different story. Um, so, you know, we ran one of these analyses like that one that I just showed you. And here you can see the cost share per price competition cluster. And you can see that gold one there, that's the bad price and the high competition. And the way that this stuff was natively serving, so to say, or naturally serving, was that um, a very large share of cost was in that bucket, not that great. Um, and meanwhile, the good price low competition is one of the smallest ones, so that's really bad. Um, even though you see that the value per click uh, is very attractive there. So why was this happening is bewildering to me because 
if the technology is functioning the way that it should with whether it's maximized conversion value or with a ROAS target, um, to me, this should not happen like that. I don't like that. Um, but as you'll see in a few slides, keep this picture in mind. You'll see in a, few, in a few slides how it could change by structuring the campaigns, knowing this information. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so structuring the campaigns, uh, you basically want to create this intelligent clustering based on your inventory, based on your business intelligence, your business objectives. There's this old framework that Google has sometimes talked about. It's not the most known program, but shopping for business objectives, which I really love. Um, and this is kind of realizing that or bringing it to life in a Pmax context. So by the way, I give the same advice to people who are still running standard shopping campaigns. It just makes sense to bring your business objectives into these channels, link them to your campaigns. Um, but I'm rambling a bit. So, you know, you can have these different um, campaigns based on um, something a little more advanced than maybe, oh, I have a brand campaign and I have a category campaign. You can have a high stock, high margin campaign. Um, you know, that stuff you want to push aggressively because the stock level supports it. You're not worrying about a stock out. Um, and the margin is great. So it can support the aggressive spending. Um, and then, you know, for example, item added within the last seven days, there's a life cycle topic. You might want to create a campaign that's always listening for those, uh, those items and, and moving, cycling them in and out so that you can be really aggressive. Maybe you don't even set a, a ROAS target. You just use max conversion value to have the most aggressive setting on trying to grab some market share with that, trying to generate some data on those new products. Um, and then you've got the asset groups. Let's, I think the next slide. Uh, explains this next part a little bit better. So I'm going to go on the next slide. So let's just say a very popular setup for smart shopping campaigns back in the day was a high margin, mid margin, and low margin. At least we saw that a lot. Um, <clears throat> I'd still, I'd still, my real recommendation is that you should just track profit, but uh, this is a great first step. Um, so what can, how can you implement that in Performance Max? Um, because I thought performance max has to do with assets. It has to do with themes. You need to generate creatives and so let Google generate these creatives. But then you're going to cluster products based on something that's not thematic because margin could be everything in the same brand might have different margins. Um, every, and then you create a margin cluster might have different brands in it or different categories. So the way that this gets resolved is pretty simple. Um, you create a high margin campaign. And by the way, the first thing you need to do is get a custom label in there that has margin data. Um, and then you create an asset group for bicycles, for example, bicycle clothing, whatever, you know, you need to find a level of segmentation that basically that there's enough volume in there. It's a sweet spot thing. You don't want to build out endless granularity, endless segmentation in here because um, yeah, that's just the old way mostly. At least, you know, if you're doing standard shopping, it's still, there's still cases there, but for Pmax, it's not a good idea. And then you need a catch-all where everything else is going to land. That's super important. Um, and you want to respect that catch-all because there'll still be a lot of volume in there. Um, <clears throat> so then that's at the asset group level where you've got, for example, brand or product type. And then at the listing group level, this is where you connect the dots. The asset level is taking care of the thematic relevance. And then the listing group, you attach the custom label there. So you're filtering for the high margin products from your custom label. And the category is bike. And now you have a combination that is thematically related and related in some kind of business objective. And then you could um, add on um, audience signals as well. And then you just replicate that structure for your mid margin campaign, your low margin campaign. And I don't wanna limit your imagination here. Any kind of business data that you have available and that is important to you can be brought into a structure like this. You just need to bear in mind that as you take on more sophisticated approaches, uh, more complexity, that it, it can create some management overhead. It can create some complexity. So you need to find this balance that works for you where um, this is worth the effort, and but this is also the best way to really do it. Um, <clears throat> so again, what do you need to do? You need to add and then update data in your feed. You need to create a campaign per business objective or business quality or attribute. 
for example, margin, and then assign your budget and your ROAS target. And so what's important here, by the way, is that the ROAS is a way effectively of pacing that budget. So with your high margin campaign, you'll set a lower ROAS target that's more aggressive because those products can support it and you wanna promote those and drive profit. With a low margin campaign, you wanna set a higher ROAS target that's going to throttle the volume a bit and make sure that you are being conservative and getting um, kind of the return that you need because you know that these are low, low margin products. So if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> yeah, then you wanna create your thematically related asset groups and then your BI based or combinatory listing groups. These are the building blocks of uh, what we call the enhanced PMAX approach. Um, <clears throat> so if you know me a little bit, you know that I usually have a light sales touch or no sales touch at all. So here's my light sales touch today. <laughs> Charming smile, I hope. Um, I won't keep it long. But basically, we um, have been working like crazy the last months to build automation that supports this, um, to ensure uptime and reliability, to support more advanced implementations with less effort. There's a user interface. Um, and then you can make sure that you're always serving the right product um, in the right bucket per target country, um, for example. And you can combine data from your systems and or our systems. We support with the data ingestion here. It just goes through what we call the online retail growth platform. We've got data preparation that we offer from our marketing engineers. We have consultancy that we offer so that you can have smart strategies in place and so that you can measure correctly. And then it's managed via an automated dashboard. And that's my sales pitch. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, if you remember that chart from a few things back, let's go back. This one where we could see that we didn't like the way the cost was distributed and that it didn't make sense based on where the value per click was located. Now we can see an example of how that can change through an approach like this. And you don't have to use our technology to do that. You can also do this on your own, but if you're interested, reach out to us. Um, so in this case, there was a campaign for good price and low competition, a campaign for bad price and high competition. So these good and bad ones and a catch all for, um, for the stuff in between. And this is just a simple setup. You know, we're just rolling out and testing with this client. But we found that 4% of items were located in one partition, 20%. Most things ended up in the everything else partition. Um, but <clears throat> you can see how the cost was distributed. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of cost in the good price, low price, and too much cost in the bad price, high competition. And we were able to shift that so that a majority of cost shifted over, almost two thirds shifted over to where we wanted it to be, where the client wanted it to be. And we were able to minimize the cost in that kind of bad bucket. Um, and then we had a healthy amount of cost and a healthy amount of revenue running through everything else. And also the value per click was positively influenced in each case. So this was really great too. Um, <clears throat> final thoughts before we get into question and answer. There are these huge mindset challenges related to Performance Max because it's all happening very fast. It's disruptive what's happening. You know, 80% of $20 billion. Think of all the advertisers involved there and it's happening in a year or less in an effect. So, <clears throat> You need change management there and you need to think about your mindset. So it's shifting from ROAS as a goal. I'm responsible to achieve this ROAS. Um, ROAS is how I decide if my campaigns are successful or not to ROAS being as a lever to pace budget. And your goals are different. Your goals are, hey, I wanna move the needle on, let's say I wanna prevent more stockouts and I wanna make sure that we're getting the volume and the products that need it, maybe volume, products that are behind sales plan. Um, it's a, so it's a shift in thinking from not just total growth, like, Hey, here's my revenue and this hyper growth mentality of the last decade, <laughs> um, but more targeted growth, profitability, um, growing where it matters and letting your competitors take the crappy auctions and the other stuff. Um, and this is hard trusting automation, which we, which is kind of a black box, but we want to 
right now, my stance is, hey, let's take up Google's offer here. Um, if you don't want to take up Google's offer, if it doesn't work for your business model, there are still standard shopping campaigns available. And by the way, 20% of 20 billion is nothing to sneeze at. That's a, there's a lot of budget that will still flow over standard shopping. And there are use cases, which we can talk about another time. Um, and then accepting this de-channeling that gets back to this kind of black box nature, search, shopping, display. We can still, you know, we can still have super cool display campaigns out there because a lot you can do with display campaigns that you can't do with Performance Max. We can still have awesome YouTube campaigns out there. Um, Google says that they want this stuff to be compatible in the end or complementary. I think where that becomes challenging is like, oh, it's not really compatible with standard shopping. It's going to cannibalize that. And it's not really, there's some challenges about how compatible is it with, with search and this brand question that comes up. But they're working on it. I, I believe it. Um, so I want to thank you. Maybe it's a little early to say thank you because we've got a QA and a coming ahead. I also want to quickly promote something here. You can whip out your uh, iPhone or whatever phone you've got and, and your QR code scanner. If you enjoy um, this presentation so far, you can check out my podcast. I really want to tease something on um, not this week, but next week. Jenny Marvin, I just spoke with her on Monday and we had a super cool 45 one hour conversation, 45 minute one hour conversation. And we talk about all this stuff and it's really cool. So check that out. You might want to um, subscribe so you don't miss it. <clears throat> and then one more QR code, last one, promise you. Um, if you are interested in learning more about our technology and our approach to this, if you're looking for help, that's going to send you to a landing page. You can also, by the way, um, just go ahead and visit our website at smarter-ecommerce.com and you'll find us there. Um, so that was it uh, for the presentation. And now I see 19 questions in the Q&A. So I'm not going to be able to get to all of those. I'm going to have a busy morning writing a blog article, it seems. Um, so let's just look through some of these. Sorry if I'm, if I'm looking up here. That's just my second screen where I've got the Q&A available. Um, what is an ideal structure for PMAX campaigns? I hope that I answered that a bit, but I'll, I can cover it again in the blog post tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. Am I able to test different audience signals on PMAX? It seems that I would need to lump together different audiences in one ad group or asset group. Um, you know, you can, you can use different audiences. Uh, that, that's definitely possible to use different audiences in parallel. And I think what you need there, they just need to be different enough. They, there needs to be meaningful differences. And that's, that's a through line in Performance Max. Your product segments need to be meaningful somehow. They need to be different enough. And your audiences need to be different enough. And your assets that are, can re relate to those audiences need to be different enough. And, and Google, for their part, their promise is that they're going to kind of take care of that for you because... <clears throat> They, um, they've got great audience data. They, they're just looking for a head start from you with your signals. And they um, are gonna generate great creatives. That's their promise. Um, I know there's probably some creatives out there cringing, but that's their promise. And they're gonna generate creatives that will perform for those audiences. Um, so yeah, definitely. If you've got really different personas and, and you've got strong audience list to support that, you've got strong assets, you can go in this direction, um, but don't don't over engineer it in the first place. Start slowly. Um, are you guys already experiencing better results on Pmax than you've had on Google Shopping? Yes, we're seeing some some really great results. But <laughs> I've tweeted about this too. We sometimes see some strange stuff as well. Um, oh man, there are 27 questions in there. I'm just getting buried more and more here. Why did I promise to write an article about this? <laughs> but. Uh, <clears throat> There's sometimes a hot and cold thing going on where we'll see we'll see campaigns that we that we're having a hard time getting to spend the way that we would like, and that's weird, <laughs> honestly. Um, <clears throat> so that's one thing that we've seen on the performance side, but we've seen ones that just crush it, um, and we're still learning there. But um, <clears throat> let's see. Be a Google Ads editor. It's possible to opt out of search network, search partner network, display. Would you recommend they consider this? Um, at least have separate worlds of, of search and shopping. 
Yeah, what, what a lot of people are doing is looking at ways particularly to, um, to isolate their brand traffic and stuff like this. There's a really cool thing from this um, company in the Netherlands, Adchieve, really great people there. Um, and they talk about like a hamburger structure. So, cause I, like what I'm here, what I'm doing here is let's take Google's product at face value and find a way without hacking it or tweaking too much to try and make the most out of it um, because it's early. And I, and I think the hacking stuff for me would come a little bit later, but there's other people out there. Check out the hamburger structure, Google that. I hope they're, they've got good SEO and you'll, uh, SEO and you'll find the result you want. Um, I have a client with a strong brand with tons of brand related searches, but searches also include very specific queries for specific products. How do I convert search ad groups into Pmax assets with maximum relevance kept? Um, I got to think about this one, I guess. Um, but def some people are saying, you know, you can check out, uh, you can find some keyword clusters too and, and make uh, asset groups on the basis of those. But sorry, I'm gonna, I just, I don't wanna lose too much time thinking. Let's just look at some more of these. Um, how would you test a campaign structure against another one to make the best data-driven decision? Testing is really hard in Pmax. Um, <clears throat> it just is, for example, Pmax versus um, standard shopping, for example, it's apples to oranges. Um, and then you don't know so much about these placements and stuff. Oh, by the way, earlier, someone was asking about placements. Definitely, I think everyone agrees, turn off the mobile app placements. They're mostly crap. Um, but back to this point about, about data-driven testing. Um, well, that's why I really recommend getting kind of a baseline first. So bring your custom labels in, and but don't structure the campaigns on them on the first place. Just let, let Pmax run a bit in a less granular way and see where the volume is just kind of occurring and what the characteristics of that distribution, like the performance characteristics are. Um, and then you've got kind of a baseline that you can then measure against once you've implemented a structure. Um, and then when you implement a new structure against an old structure, yeah, it's tricky. It's, it's definitely tricky to have a good approach. And I'll think, I'll think about that one some more. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. Um, if you import margin information via Google Click ID and automated API offline import, does the seg segmentation in terms of campaign structuring still make sense? Wouldn't smart bidding already do the job for you without structuring as higher value SKUs get pushed via bidding? <clears throat> I definitely, I think it's great if you implement a gross profit bidding like this because yeah, then, ROAS becomes POAS, profit on ad spend instead of revenue on ad spend. Because that's a beautiful thing about ROAS. It's conversion value, the relation, the ratio of conversion value to cost, not um, doesn't have to be revenue, whatever conversion value you want. Um, so yeah, smart bidding would would kind of take care of that for you. But would higher value SKUs get pushed via bidding? I mean, check it out because um, like in that case that we saw, the value per click, the high, like it, it didn't, it, there was some kind of a mismatch going on for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, it can still absolutely make sure it makes sense to use campaign structuring because imagine that you're bidding on gross profit. Okay, that's great. Now you're ensuring that Pmax is delivering you profitability, that it's taking care of you, right? You can have more confidence because ROAS. There are companies that have gone bankrupt on ROAS. I'm sorry, but that's true. So be careful with ROAS. Uh, pro, ROAS is not profit. Um, so you can have kind of a security of knowing that you're actually profitable here. <clears throat> then you can take care of other things um, like, you know, looking at, uh, yeah, your sell-through rate or your stock levels, whatever the case might be. It's a great combination. It's totally complementary. Um, Let's see. Which content to use when you create a performance max campaign based on price and competition? Um, and is a performance max campaign with specific product category content not more uh, efficient? Well, I think the campaign, it does have the product category content through the asset group. So um, if I'm understanding the question right, um, 
and then you're just adding an additional signal on there. I'm sorry, my alarm. Usually I'm picking up my son from preschool right now. My alarm just went off. <laughs> um, sorry, where were we? But um, oh yeah, which content to use for price and um, competition? So yeah, you need to get that data from somewhere. Um, it's not. It's not kind of. You know, there are different ways that you can get price intelligence. There are price intelligence providers. Um, we also provide price intelligence. Um, and competition density intelligence, we provide both of those things. You could also look at um, auction insights for some insights here. Um, Stefan Nate Fischer, really smart guy, posting great stuff on LinkedIn and his company's Paymafor, I think it's called. Um, <clears throat> he's got a really interesting approach to auction insights and he has a script for that too, for example. So there's stuff out there um, if you don't wanna buy competition data. Um, <clears throat> have you seen a performance difference between B2B and B2C clients? I'm going to check that out in more detail for you. Um, I know that we've got uh, both kinds of, of companies running on Pmax, but I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know, to be honest, um, if we've seen a big difference, if, if it's working really well for one and not for the other. I don't think, I haven't heard something like that. Um, <clears throat> how are we on time here? I don't even remember what time what our time box is. Just uh, just drop out if 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 you need to go because we got more questions here. Um, do you have any experience using the conversion value rules within Pmax? And if so, do you see any benefit in implementing them? Um, not not the most, to be honest. I, I haven't personally, um, <clears throat> but. Boy, you know, my understand. I find the conversion value rules really interesting. Um, generally, I think that there's been this shift in Google Ads from talking about bid modifiers and CPC toward talking about conversion value. What are you measuring and why? Conversion value rules. Um, value per click, I think, is a cool alternative to CPC or ROAS. Um, so this kind of shift from cost to value. Um, but I think conversion value rules are first and foremost the most useful for lead gen businesses that don't have a conversion value in place um, because a, a lot of this is solved by like that. It, that's so you, you, you can demonstrate that the lead is getting qualified or so on. Um, but you could also consider this as a way to arguably replace device modifiers from the past, maybe because you can set some device um, rules in there. Um, you just have to be aware that it's going to affect your reporting. And I'm always the thing I'm always afraid of with conversion value rules is, you know, how do you set the rule? How do you decide, okay, this is worth X multiplier or whatever. Um, and then, you know, I think there's hygiene or, or maintenance data quality in there too, because it's going to, it's going to change your reporting. So if you're tinkering with it a lot, your reporting, you need to, you need to have this really, well annotated or you need to be careful with it. I, I, I wouldn't tread too lightly with conversion value rules, um, but there's great content out there from like Fed, Frederick Fillets from Optimizer. He's got a whole guide to conversion value rules. So check it out. Um, I'll link it in the article whenever I write it or Google it. Um, thoughts on bidding option for new customers. I don't like that they add on revenue automatically with each new customer. Okay, well, this is what we're talking about, right? That it's gonna change. Um, your reporting, but um, <clears throat> generally though, I think new customer acquisition, that's really a wonderful key performance indicator for all of us, right? Um, I mean, of course you don't wanna just neglect your existing customers either, but um, it's very attractive. I'm getting a cue from the from our event organizers here that I should wrap up soon. Um, but uh, I think it's a nice, it's a nice service that Google is offering. It's worth testing, um, but there could be other ways of implementing this too. Um, I have to think about that. Um, here, I'll, I'll answer one last one, okay? You say price is the new bidding. What exactly did you mean? Well, it's kind of a, a clickbait statement. It's kind of intentionally controversial, um, but... <clears throat> Price we know is just a huge factor in, in where people are gonna click and um, you don't wanna damage your brand here, but um, I just feel that the pricing, you know, if you can find the right strategy here where you've got like a, 
a margin-based pricing, but you know where you can offer um, an attractive price and still have your margin supported or where you say, listen, I'm standing my ground with this price. It all depends on your pricing strategy. But um, I guess, let me here, let me, let me make this more concrete. Something that I'm watching closely and that I'm really curious about. I don't know if you've heard about this beta. It's called automated discounting. Um, and it's available for not only Shopify users and WooCommerce, I, I don't remember, not, not only the shop systems, but anyone can do it. But the shop systems, they've got these direct integrations with Google. And so, you know, the challenge with dynamic pricing and Google ads is that, especially if you really want to have auction time dynamic pricing, which is a whole different category, um, your, your landing page needs to match that advertised pricing. And so there needs to, you know, if, if a price is being calculated on a fly in the auction, it needs to match that, your landing page. And the shop systems can handle this very easily with one click, basically. Um, and so what I could imagine is that there is, there could be a big wave of adoption coming from these, um, from the Shopify users. And, and let's assume that the automated discounting is working really well. And it could almost force the rest of the market to get more serious about something like that. I think the, the things that speak against that are generally uh, auction time bidding to me seems very much at risk of price discrimination, um, <clears throat> illegal. <laughs> and in the EU, there's new regulation here too, of course, um, the omnibus, um, check it out, Google omnibus regulation. If you haven't heard of it, it should be on your radar because you need to fulfill certain requirements about you know what is the the lowest price or the average price or things like this in the last 30 days, for example, um, because they want to reduce price manipulation that, that was occurring. In, um, and so I think it's a super thorny topic, but I do think when, when all the other things, you know, so many different strategies are falling away, price is one of the last levers that's out there and Google's making a play for that too with the automated discounting. But um, I don't know, I guess I should probably wrap this up I want to thank you everyone for joining me. This was really fun. And um, as I said, um, whoops, I'm still sharing my screen. Um, as I said, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to write an article with all the questions answered. And um, yeah, thanks so much. I really enjoyed, enjoyed this session. Take care.